Well, I'm Gleaves Whitney, director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University, and we're so pleased that you've joined us this evening for a very special event at the Hallenstein Center. And speaking of Hallenstein, I want to point out that Ralph Hallenstein is with us this evening, and he just celebrated his 98th birthday. We're always fortunate here at Grand Valley to have great partners to do the programs that we do, and this evening is no exception. And I'd like to thank Jim Good, representing the History Department. Jim, where are you this evening? Okay, Jim Good up here in the front, and also Mejd Al Mala, representing the Middle East Studies Program, for supporting tonight's event. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, the best way to introduce tonight's speaker is really to point to the title of his most recent book, Engaging the Muslim World. That, in essence, is what Professor Juan Cole has been doing for three decades, the last three decades of his life. You know, he does it, he seeks to bridge the West and Islam in a number of significant ways. First, he's a distinguished professor of history at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor where he is really leaving a legacy of a number of students who are well-informed, historically competent people going out into the professional world. Second, he is a writer of eminent books like this and other books, uh, Napoleon's Egypt and Sacred Space and Holy War, and he's an editor of many other volumes, and he's a prolific article writer as well. Third, he's a serious blogger. He's totally high-tech. Check out his site called Informed Comment for the latest in the Middle East. Fourth, he is an international scholar and a world traveler who has spent more than 10 years of his life living in the Middle East, in the, in the Muslim world. He's been an inhabitant in such cities as Cairo, Beirut, Amman, Lahore, and others. And last but not least, he has tried to bridge the West and the Muslim world in his marriage. To know Juan Cole is also to know his wife, Sheena, who's in the front row here. Thank you for being here, Sheena. Sheena is a Pakistan-born lawyer who, Juan admits, keeps him in line. <laughs> Sheena and Juan met back in the 1970s when she was a teacher of Urdu, and Juan was her student. Sheena, thank you for being with us this evening, and we've put you in the front row to keep him in line, okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Juan Cole. Well, uh, is this thing on? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction, Gleaves, and uh, thanks so much to the uh, Hohenstein uh, Center for Presidential Studies uh, here uh, at Grand Valley State University for having me speak uh, in this prestigious uh, uh, lecture series. It does me much honor, uh, and I will uh, try to rise to the occasion. Um, this evening, my charge is to talk about engaging the Muslim world in the context of the Obama administration. Uh, it is, I think, a rather significant part of uh, the Obama administration's foreign policy uh, to reconfigure the U.S. relationship with the Middle East and more broadly with the Muslim world. Uh, and um, I want to uh, give a roughly one year report card uh, on how that's going. As you can imagine, there are ups and downs. We have to start with what was there before. Uh, the Bush administration foreign policy uh, has been characterized as muscular Wilsonianism. Uh, Woodrow Wilson thought it would be a good thing to establish uh, uh, democracy around the world and uh, uh, recognize rights of self-determination of peoples, but he wanted to work through the League of Nations and was uh, interested in international law, uh, except for that little glitch in Mexico. Um, and uh, uh, the Bush administration, however, uh, uh, really did argue that democracy could be established at the point uh, of a gun. 
and uh, uh, made the argument for Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, to some extent Pakistan. Now the U.S. became militarily involved in a big way in the, in the, in the Middle East, in the Muslim world. It invaded two uh, major Muslim countries and militarily occupied them uh, and still continues to have very substantial numbers of troops in both. Uh, from the point of view of the United States, this was uh, often uh, thought of as a natural and almost inevitable response to the September 11th attacks, which had come from the Middle East, uh, had come from Afghanistan, the personnel involved, you know, the 19 hijackers, some were Egyptian, Lebanese, United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudis, and others. Uh, so, but from the point of view of most people in the Middle East, uh, they couldn't figure out what in the world had gotten in the United States. Uh, they had remembered it as, uh, you know, an alternative to the colonial traditions of European dominance by, of, the, of the region by Britain and France. Uh, they had known the United States uh, as a much more subtle kind of great power uh, that didn't involve uh, actually you know, appointing the deputy commissioner of the provinces of the Middle East uh, the way the British and the French had. Uh, but here we had the United States essentially running two major uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, and there was a great deal of consternation and dissatisfaction about this to the point that it provoked a great deal of violence as a response, but it also hurt the image of the United States in the region. Uh, back in 2000, uh, in the last year of the Clinton administration, when asked, 75% of Indonesians said they had a favorable or very favorable view of the United States. Now, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, population-wise. 75% thought well or very well of the United States. I don't know if we could quite get to those numbers nowadays from Americans. <laughs> well, uh, in the last year of the Bush administration, it was about 15% that thought well or very well of the United States and Indonesia. Our public opinion polling sort of tracked with the president's uh, in this country, uh, around the world. Our name became mud. Likewise, Turkey. 56% said they had a very or favorable or very favorable view of the United States in, in the last year of the Clinton administration. Turkey is a NATO ally. It's a major Muslim country, but it's very close to the West, to the United States. Uh, has good relations with Israel, uh, at least until recently. 56%. And this is despite the fact that the Turkish military had often been backed by the United States in, well, let us say, human rights violations. Uh, in the last year of the Bush administration, 9% of Turks said that they thought well of the United States. So you can see this is a, a phenomenon uh, that uh, whatever achievements might have been there of the Bush administration in the region, and uh, no one would deny that there uh, were some achievements, uh, they were cast into the shade by the negative reaction to the way the U.S. was perceived uh, as acting. Um, I would argue that uh, the invasion and occupation of Iraq threw that country into vast turmoil. Uh, we don't know exactly how many people died in the ensuing war, but it's certainly hundreds of thousands. And you can multiply those by three to get the number of wounded. It's a country of widows a uh, country of orphans, a country of some four million displaced people, homeless, some of them displaced abroad to Syria and Jordan, others of them displaced inside the country. Uh, uh, these recent elections that they had now are often being touted in the U.S. press as signs that, well, maybe it wasn't such a bad move after all. But I don't know how you go to the Iraqi people and said, well, oops, you know, we may have thrown your country into that kind of turmoil where hundreds of thousands of people are dead, millions are displaced, but at least, you know, you've now got elections. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those later. Uh, so I think, you know, 
uh, there were other things. The uh, establishment of essentially um, concentration camps in Guantanamo and Bagram, where people were held without access to lawyers, without habeas corpus, without the right to have charges against them uh, heard before a judge, uh, held without any prospect of ever being tried uh, in any way, uh, and perhaps life imprisonment for suspicion of being uh, a terrorist. Um, anybody who knows anything about Afghanistan knows that a lot of those people were picked up on the say-so of, uh, of bounty hunters. And so people were fingered, oh yeah, you've got a Taliban over there. He's very dangerous. Now give me my money. Uh, and then whoosh, the guy would be in Guantanamo. Now, of course, there were very dangerous people in Guantanamo as well. But there were also innocents. Uh, I do a certain amount of consulting in Washington. I can tell you there were, uh, there were some Iraqi Shiites got, got turned in by the Taliban. Well, Iraqi Shiites were our allies in the Iraq War, and they don't get along with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, who are from the Sunni branch of Islam. And there's no way, way in God's green earth that those people were Taliban. Uh, they, in fact, almost certainly got sold to the U.S. by Taliban, uh, who uh, uh, dissimulated. Uh, so there were innocent people in Guantanamo. There are a lot of innocent people in, in Bagram. Some of them got tortured. And it got out. Uh, and and uh, Abu Ghraib uh, photographs uh, can't, be, can't be stuffed back into Pandora's box. The, the Muslim world judges the United States as a barbaric and perverted nation because the United States engaged in systematic torture and sexual humiliation of people of which it took photographs in order to blackmail them with their clan uh, and their personal reputation. And when those photographs got out, uh, the U.S. Uh, name was mud. Um, and then uh, there were people in the political sphere in the United States who began to really configure Islam as the enemy. Uh, given that there are 1.5 billion Muslims, I would have thought that that's unwise. Um, you'd want to choose a smaller group <laughs> to make your enemy. Um, but uh, uh, in the last presidential election, uh, Joe Biden observed of uh, uh, Rudolph Giuliani's campaign that all of the stump speeches seemed to be about a verb, a noun, and 9-11. Uh, and uh, phrases start emerging in our political vocabulary like uh, Islamofascism. I don't really get that one. What I was taught at school was that fascism was a political ideology that was developed by really, really conservative people in Spain and Italy who I think, like our Christians and Europeans, and I can't think of any fascist countries that we fought in World War II in the Middle East. In fact, Weren't like the Vichy French oppressing the Moroccans? Didn't the Moroccans say, no, you can't do that to our Jews? Um, this fascism business seems to me to be not part of the Middle East, but rather to be very European in character. And it's kind of a little trick we play with ourselves that when we talk about the West and we think about Beethoven and Goethe and Voltaire and so forth, but, you know, Hitler, Franco, Mussolini, those somehow are not, not in Europe. They're not part of the European tradition. Apparently, they're, they're Muslim Middle Easterners uh, uh, because of, of this uh, Islamofascism. Uh, and, you know, it is extremely offensive to talk about Islamofascism uh, because Islam is a sacred word. And then uh, Mr. Giuliani uh, complained. He said, people... People, people accuse us of prejudice for saying things like Isla Islamic terrorism or Islamofascism. Who are we offending except the Islamic terrorists? Well, let me explain this to you, Rudy. The, uh, the reason that it's offensive is because the word Islamic has to do with norms and ideals. And it is 
rather like the word Judaic. So we have at the University of Michigan a center for Judaic studies. The word Judaic has to do with the norms and ideals of the Jewish religion. Uh, and the word Islamic, you can have Islamic ethics and so forth. But you can't have an Islamic burglar because theft is forbidden in the Quran. And you know, I'm quite sure our Center for Judaic Studies doesn't you know, specialize in the study of Bugsy Siegel either. Uh, so um, you can have a Jewish gangster, but that's not Judaic. Uh, so you can't have an Islamic terrorist or an Islamic fascist because that's contrary. Uh, it's, it's just simple diction, it's, it's wrong. But that kind of language became very common in our politics in 2006 and again in 2008. Um, and uh, Mr. Bush, I think, actually deserves some credit for not using it early on, but by 2006, 2005, he'd begun to, to fall uh, into that. And, uh, and other politicians used it quite extensively. There were uh, very vehement reactions from the Muslim world when they heard, because you know, they get Fox Cable News over there. And uh, they, they were very upset and wrote lots of protests and opinion pieces and so forth. So configuring, uh, uh, and, and the implication, of course, is that it's, it's all Muslims. It's the Muslim religion. There's something wrong with those people. This way of thinking is very common now in the United States, that you know, there is a problem with Islam. Well, I don't know. Uh, I tried to figure it out that between 1900 and 1950, I figure white Christian people in Europe and elsewhere polished off about 70 million human beings. There were two world wars, lots of ancillary wars, colonial wars, pogroms, genocides. Must be at least 70, maybe more, million people dead at the hands of Christian Europeans or Europeans of Christian background. In that period, 1900 to 1950, mm, I don't think Muslims killed hardly anybody. It's not because Muslims are better than Christians. Muslims mostly didn't have their own governments at that time. They were being ruled by the French, the British, the Dutch, the Americans, and so forth. Second of all, the reason the Europeans were able to polish off so many people is because they had industrialized warfare. The Muslims hadn't yet done that. Now they're catching up. But it seems to me like human beings, you know, uh, don't differ by culture in their bloody mindedness. Uh, the human beings are human beings everywhere. Nothing particularly violent about Muslim culture. Uh, and if you wanted to make an argument that, that some culture was particularly violent, well, I think you'd have to, on the evidence of the last 150 years ago, finger, finger European culture. But that wouldn't be right either. Well, now we've got a new administration. And Mr. Obama was very well aware uh, given his background, his Muslim relatives in Kenya, uh, his uh, half-sister is Indonesian. Uh, he is very well aware of the problems in the American relationship to the Muslim world. And so he wants to reset it. Last year this time, he addressed the uh, people of Iran uh, on the occasion of the Persian New Year, which is, their vernal, is, the, is the vernal equinox, uh, and offered direct talks with the Iranian government. During the Bush administration, wasn't allowed to talk directly to the Iranian government. I, they had one meeting over, over Iraq. Uh, but uh, for the most part, they kind of just like taunted and insulted each other uh, in between ignoring each other's existence. So Obama wanted to turn that around and talk to them. Uh, then um, he made addresses to the Muslim world in Turkey, uh, in Cairo which were wildly popular. Uh, he uh, proposed a two-state solution in Israel and Palestine. The Palestinians should be given their own state. To be fair, President Bush was the first US president to endorse a Palestinian state. Unfortunately, uh, 
uh, it's hard to see any movement towards such a state uh, after that speech that he gave at the United Nations. Uh, Obama wanted to implement that idea. Uh, Obama was committed to a, a withdrawal from Iraq. He had originally wanted a fast withdrawal. The Bush administration gave in to the Iraqis and agreed to a timetable for withdrawal uh, that was very convenient for, for Mr. Obama. Uh, and I think the Iraqis who negotiated that uh, with a timetable took some hope that Obama might well be the president and they used that as leverage with Mr. Bush uh, so that all U.S. troops are to be out of Iraq by the end of 2011. Uh, and then um, Mr. Obama wanted to firm up Afghanistan and then get out of it as well. So he comes into office with two wars in the region. He wants to wrap them up and, uh, and move on to other things. He comes into office with very, very bad relations with the Muslim world, with Iran. He wants to put things on a new footing. Uh, and his speeches uh, went a long way towards changing uh, the image of the United States, towards uh, uh, establishing new possibilities for dialogue uh, for diplomatic and other relations. Um, so let me turn now to whether engagement is possible. Is what Mr. Obama wants to do very likely? Well, actually, yes. Uh, and I think most Americans would be surprised at how uh, thoroughgoing the, the, the possibilities of good relations and dialogue between the United States and the Muslim world are. Uh, and um, in po opinion polling, uh, Muslim publics say they want better relations with the U.S. And this includes very conservative, hardline Muslim states like, like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, Tony Horowitz is a journalist, and he kind of kicked around the Middle East in the 80s, and uh, he tells the story that he was in Iran, and he saw this crowd of people, and you know, ritually, the people who uh, made the revolution in 1979 and follow Khomeini, they say, death to America, Magbar Amrika, they chanted. So they were marching along saying this. So he fell in with them, and after a while, one of them noticed him. And, uh, said, you know, who are you? And he said, well, you know, I'm an American tourist, and uh, uh, I saw you were having this uh, procession. I thought I'd come and join it. So uh, the man said, death to America. And in between, between the conversation, he said, well, you're from America? And Tony says, yes. He said, well, you know, I've always wanted to visit Disney World. <laughs> so sometimes the political rec rhetoric hides other realities. But the Saudis say they want better relations with the US. The Pakistanis say that, the public. Most of them say, you know, if you ask them, well, what do you want from the US? They, they say hospitals, technology, be medical aid, better schools. They say, well, you tend to send us a lot of shiny equipment, F-18s and things. Please stop. It's other things we want from you. Uh, and then, I was on the Colbert show last year, and I, I stumped Steve Colbert. He, he didn't have a quick comeback back to this one with a statistic from a poll in Saudi Arabia. 80% of Saudis say, over 80% of Saudis say, that terrorism is the number one threat to the Saudi kingdom. Now, this is very different from the attitude after 9 11 when people in the Middle East kind of thought, well, that's really unfortunate, but it's sort of their problem. Now it's come home. There's been bombings in Riyadh and so forth. 80, over 80% 80 Saudis say that terrorism is the number one problem facing the Saudi society. And about 10% of Saudis still say they admire Al-Qaeda. Now we hear that and it's kind of alarming. 10% say they admire Al-Qaeda. But most of those, you know, you ask them and they don't believe Al-Qaeda did 9-11 and they remember it as something that fought the atheist Soviets who had come into Afghanistan, you know, what Ronald Reagan called the freedom fighters. They're still thought of as freedom fighters uh, in Saudi Arabia. But they, they, they disaggregated the poll. They found over 80% of the Al-Qaeda supporters said that terrorism was the number one problem facing Saudi Arabia. 
So Steve didn't have a good comeback to that one. Um, and a lot of the rhetoric you heard in the last uh, decade about the Muslim world uh, configured it as kind of a new Soviet Union, as a threat to the United States uh, of, a, of a Soviet proportion. So we got to gin up the Pentagon. We got to worry about these people that are coming for us. It's a big new block, and so forth. Well, I could never understand what in the world people were talking about when they, they talked like that. And I heard congressmen give talks in which they, they, they uh, gave this overview. And I can't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Because if you travel in the Middle East and you study the Middle East and you know it, I can't find any Soviet Union in it. So what do I find? Well, let's start in the West. Morocco. Morocco is a Muslim country. It's got a king. They go to mosque. Very close allies of the United States. U.S. major trader, number one trading partner for Morocco. Gets its military equipment from the United States. Gives U.S. overflight, basing rights, all kinds of things. So Morocco, not a threat to the United States. And you move over to Algeria. Just fought a civil war the last 15 years in Algeria. The secular government faced off against the, the Muslim fundamentalists and crushed them. Well, I think they went a little too far. You know, 100, over 100,000 people died in the civil war. But you can't say the Algerian government is like Muslim fundamentalist anti-US. They're very close to the US and France. Tunisia, that's a little bit embarrassing how much of an ally Tunisia is to the United States. They're kind of a soft dictatorship. They don't put up with any fundamentalism. Um, Libya, well, nobody can understand what's going on in Libya. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, they, they seem to have come in from the cold somehow. Uh, and Egypt, non-NATO ally of the US, does joint military operations with the US. We give them $2 billion a year in military and civilian aid. Egypt not gunning for us. Jordan, another one of those embarrassing situations. Uh, it's like when you know, you're know you kind of friends with someone you don't like that much, but they really love you. Uh, uh, that's Jordan. Um, I could just go on, you know, through the Muslim world, Pakistan, a non-NATO ally, uh, Bahrain, a non-NATO ally, Kuwait, non-NATO ally, Turkey, NATO ally. I can't, I kind of coded this map, you know, pro-American, pro pro-American countries that are uh, secular, I put in blue, and then uh, pro-American countries that are conservative, I, I uh, kind of Muslim or conservative, I put in, that's that kind of light, light green or light yellow. And then um, the anti-American secular and the anti-American conservative, I coded as dark red or dark green. So it seems to be like this big threat they're talking about is Syria, Iran, and part of Sudan. That's the big threat. Everybody else seems to be like an ally. Um, and they don't have anything in common with each other. They don't even like each other, uh, uh, the people at least. Uh, Syrians mostly Sunnis, I Iranians are Shiites, Sudanese are Sunnis, and so forth. So um, I can't find it. I keep hearing this rhetoric from our politicians. I hear it on, on the press. I, I, don't, I can't find it. Does it matter? Do we need the Muslim world? Well, yes, it matters, and yes, we need them. Some people, Edward Lutvak, conservative pundit, at one point said, you know, um, what the Italians found is they kept putting resources into trying to do something about Sicily, but it's best just to leave backward people alone. Right to him, not to me. That's what he said. So kind of, Let's just not pay so much attention to the Middle East. Well, it's not possible. Uh, the, the world's demography is changing rapidly. We're hoping that it'll kind of settle down around 2050 at, at, at 12 billion. That would be a good scenario. Maybe even less, maybe as little as nine. 
Uh, depends on how many kids they go on having. Uh, but whatever it may be, the high natal areas, the places with big population growth, are uh, uh, Africa and parts of Asia, uh, some of Latin America, although that's settling down. And a lot of it is Muslim. So if the world settles down at, uh, uh, at 9 billion, uh, then nearly 3 billion of the 9 will be Muslim. One in third, one in three of, Ameri of, of, of people in the world. Well, you can't be a great power if you um, have bad relations with a third of the world. There's a security issue. Uh, as I mentioned with regard to Saudi Arabia, uh, it's, a, it's now a sh uh, widely perceived as a joint security issue because Muslim countries are undergoing very rapid change. And some of that change is producing social violence. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, and, its, uh, and its allies need to partner in that regard. Uh, that's what's going on in Pakistan as we speak. Uh, there are the, the problem of uh, Israel and Palestine may seem a small problem in a corner of the Middle East. Uh, there are only a little over 7 million Israelis. Uh, there are about 9 million Palestinians all spread around. Uh, uh, you could fit both of them in Cairo and uh, there would still be a majority of other kinds of people in Cairo. Uh, so uh, it may seem a small thing. But every day, if you look at uh, Arab satellite news, you pick up a pan-Arab newspaper, number one headline, what horrible thing the Israelis did to the people of Gaza or the West Bank today. And people's blood boil about, boils about this in the Middle East. Uh, it, you can say it's irrational. Why are they so fixated on that? But it is the case. Uh, and I, I get pushed back whenever I come and tell American audiences, they're really angry at us over this. And it's universal. And it sets us off with a, to a, you know, with a, with a bad uh, uh, footing. Um, you, you're a businessman. You go to Saudi Arabia. You want to sell them caterpillars or, or some kind of equipment. They say, yeah, but what are you doing for the Palestinians? You know, it's to that extent. Why, how come you're so one-sided? Uh, I speak Arabic, so I am a very unfortunate situation of, you know, they can talk to me, and they finally found the person who is responsible, uh, and uh, they let me have it. Uh, so, um, and uh, just last week, General uh, David Petraeus, uh, the CENTCOM commander, Central Command is the Middle East for the U.S. military, told the Senate. He said, you know, this, this festering problem of Israel and Palestine is endangering our troops. Um, and then we shouldn't forget a completely uncultural element that has nothing to do with religion, which is energy. In Central Asia and the Persian Gulf, you have something like 70% of the world petroleum reserves, 65% uh, uh, of natural gas reserves. Uh, and uh, although the U.S. has a lot of natural gas, has a lot of coal, uh, so far at least our uh, vehicles are mainly run by petroleum, uh, and um, uh, we are in competition for that energy with China increasingly, uh, and uh, India is coming up. A lot of the Asian uh, great powers are uh, rapidly developing industrialized societies, and they are um, uh, very unfortunately, I think, uh, turning to automobiles as their form of trans transport. Uh, what I'd like to tell them as somebody who uh, has been in Michigan now for a pretty long time, that that's, that's a great starter, but uh, I don't know if it has much of a future. Uh, and uh, you might want to think about mass transit. Uh, apparently, shipping things around by rail is much, much, much less expensive than trucks and cars and things. But China is now to the point where it's importing three and a half million barrels a day of petroleum. It's the second largest importer after the United States. The United States imports, it's less this year, but it, it, often it's in, imported 12 million barrels a day. Um, well, uh, there's only so much of it, and we're increasingly in competition for it. And who has it? It was the Muslims. 
So if you don't like walking, I suggest you make friends with Muslims. Um, now, what's the number one, according to opinion polling, what the number one thing that roils relations between the United States and the Arab world? The Arab world is, by the way, a small subset of the Muslim world. Uh, those experts that come on TV are always talking about Iran and other Arab countries. <laughs> it's like talking about Spain and other Teutonic countries. Um, uh, Iran, in Iran, they don't speak Arabic, they speak Persian, which is an Indo-European language, ultimately related to English. The word for brother in Persian, battle dar. You can hear the similarity, brother, battle dar. It's the same word. Uh, our ancestors, or, or at least uh, linguistic ancestors, uh, spoke the same language. The word for, er for, for, for brother in Arabic is ach. Not the same language family. So um, the people who speak Arabic, and it's not an ethnic group so much as it is a linguistic group, as people who speak Arabic uh, have a certain amount of common feeling, and they talk about the Arab world and, and so forth. So among Arabic speakers, who are about a third of the Muslim world, uh, the number one issue is Iraq. They want the US out. They consider that invasion to have been a violation of international norms. They consider U.S. presence in Iraq to be a form of military occupation, to be uh, a blow at Arab independence. And remember, a lot of these peoples we're talking about were colonized for a very long time by white Christian Europeans. Uh, I once gave a talk to a group of FBI people, and uh, uh, one of them raised their hand after a while, and they sa she said, are you telling me that they're blaming us for the French, Dutch, and, and British empires and what they did to them? And I said, yes. She said, well, that's not fair. I said, life is not fair. Well, the United States, in some ways, is seen as a successor to the colonial states. And what you would want to do to convince them that we're not you know, like the British or the French is like not invade and occupy them. But um, uh, we haven't done that argument very much good in recent years. Uh, so uh, they all say, if you ask them, that you know, they say they want better relations with the US. And if you ask them, well, what would make for better relations, they say uh, successful disengagement from Iraq. And in that, you know, on that issue, the Obama administration, uh, you can say, has been skillful or has caught a break. Uh, we're catching history on the run here. We have to analyze it. But it's going well. Um, I mean, Iraq is not a shining beacon on a hill of democracy the way the neoconservatives promised us. Uh, it is a basket case. It's a very fragile society with a lot of violence, bombings, uh, ethnic violence, and so forth. But it's much better than it was. Back in 2006, yeah. 2,500, 3,000 civilians showing up dead every month in the streets. This was an apocalypse. No, it's 200 to 400 civilians a month showing up dead. It's not, you know, Hawaii, but it's, it's better than it was. And the Iraqi army now is picking up some of the slack. They're establishing security. My, my friends among officers who've served in Baghdad tell me they, that they see the Iraqi military can now patrol independently. They'll stand and fight. They'll take on the militias, provide some security. They're not perfect, but much better than it was three, four years ago when there really was no army. And so uh, the likelihood is uh, that we get a fairly faithful adherence to the timetable that was set out in the Status of Forces Agreement between the Iraqi Parliament and the US President. I, I don't know how come the Iraqi Parliament got to have a say, but Congress didn't. It was just an agreement between the President and their Parliament. I, I take it that their Parliament is like a little bit more democratic than our system. But um, in any case, they just had elections March 7th. 
despite what you're reading in the US press or seeing on television, it's not clear who won yet <laughs> because it's a parliamentary system. So there are 325 seats in their parliament. In order to form a government and rule, you have to have 163 seats. So one guy, Ayat Alawi, got 91 seats. Another guy, uh, the current prime minister, uh, Nouri al-Maliki, uh, got uh, uh, 89 seats. And then the Shiite uh, cleric Muqtada Sadr uh, led a party that altogether got 70 seats. He, he got about 38 of them. So 91, 89 in, in that system are useless. You have to have 163 to get anything done. And so they've, they've got to scramble now to make coalitions with one another. So um, Ayad Alawi, who's a uh, hardline ex a secularist, who was a CIA asset in London that organized the, the officers who defected from Saddam, and who apparently once blew up a bus of school children in Baghdad back in the old days when they were doing terrorism to get rid of Saddam, uh, is in competition with Nouri al-Maliki, who ran the Islamic Mission Party, a radical Shiite group that once an Islamic state, he's now the prime minister, uh, he's, he's moderated his views, but um, they like blew up the US embassy in Kuwait back in the 80s, and he was the Damascus bureau chief of this revolutionary organization for 20 years. So that's what you've got in Iraq. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge between the uh, hardline Shiite revolutionary and the old time secular CIA asset. And who gets to be prime minister is dependent upon who Muqtada Sadr, the fiery young Shiite cleric who fought the Marines back in 2004, likes better. This is why I say, not a shining beacon on the hill. Nevertheless, there is likely to be a government, and, and maybe they may all be in it, maybe a government of national unity. Uh, it probably won't get much done if it is. But you know, that's not the worst thing in the world. Will Rogers one time, uh, the, the comedian once uh, uh, was invited, it was a mistake, but he was invited to address uh, a, a presidential party for Warren Harding, and he said, Warren Harding hasn't done anything. Well, that was pretty much what the American people put him there to do. Uh, well, that government may not do anything, but then I don't think the Iraqis want the government to do that much. Um, so there's likely to be a government out of it. And there wasn't a lot of violence in this election, as, as we had feared. The army seems to have held together. It's entirely plausible now that Obama takes out a, a majority of the troops that are now in Iraq. Well, uh, he, he's down to 96,000. When he came into office, it was 160,000. And actually, I think the US press is not doing a very good job because we don't know this. I mean, there was never a headline. Obama takes 60,000 troops out of Iraq. You know what I mean? Uh, people might have been happy to hear about it if, if they'd been told. So um, they're down to 96,000. They're planning to be down to 50,000 non-combat troops by September 1st of this year. So I say that's a win for Obama. The Arabs want it. Majority of the American public in polling said that they wanted it, uh, and that's happening. Then uh, in northern Pakistan, you have a big problem with social violence, and the, the Taliban uh, established themselves there. Taliban originally were Afghans. There weren't any Pakistani Taliban. But there began to be Pakistani Taliban in the last decade. And uh, as with Taliban everywhere, uh, they were whipping people and blowing things up. This presented a problem to the Pakistani government. Pakistan is a multi-ethnic state, and the northwest part of it was inhabited by people who spoke the Pushtu language, called Pushtuns, uh, and the Taliban spring from them. There are hardly any Taliban from any other ethnic group but the Pushtuns. But a majority of Pushtuns are not Taliban. They're a kind of fringe movement. So um, as 
British India had been formed and then Pakistan and India came out of it in 47, the tradition had been that the central government doesn't bother Pushtuns too much. Pushtuns are, you know, tribally organized people. They all have guns. Uh, they live in very rugged, remote areas. And uh, the government just doesn't want to, it's a hornet's nest, doesn't want to put its finger in there. So when the Taliban arose in those areas of the Northwest by, uh, uh, and, and began blowing things up and, and taking and holding territory, the instinct of the Pakistani government was, oh, they're push tunes, what do you expect? Uh, and we're not getting involved. And that was not the right answer from Obama's point of view. Obama came into office convinced that the Pakistani elites down in Islamabad had a Taliban problem which they were refusing to deal with. They were refusing to deal with it because there was kind of a tradition of states' rights in the Pushtun Northwest. But um, uh, from Obama's point of view, they had to own this problem. So um, I wonder sometimes, you know, because uh, the, the, the states that had Jim Crow and uh, resisted the civil rights uh, laws back in the 60s often put forward an argument for states' rights uh, and that maybe Obama was not very sympathetic to that argument, whether it was made in Alabama or in uh, the Northwest Frontier <coughs> Province of Pakistan. Uh, and uh, so, um, uh, the old military government was more or less overthrown by street crowds in Pakistan and they elected an elected uh, parliamentary government led by Asif Ali Zardari. Uh, and it was he that Obama pressured to take on the tribes. Uh, Zardari had been married to former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and uh, it was widely believed in Pakistan, it's not for sure, uh, but certainly it was the official position that uh, the Taliban uh, of the Masood tribe killed her in a big explosion. So um, uh, if, if Zardari does believe that, you could imagine him having a certain amount of grudge with the uh, Pakistani Taliban. And so, last year this time, Obama twisted the Pakistani go government's arm and the military arm to go into SWAT where the Taliban had established themselves and dislodge them. To send the army into a civilian populated area and fight with these uh, fundamentalist forces. It would be a little bit like uh, sending the U.S. Army into Michigan to take on the Hutari if the Hutari had taken and held territory in Michigan. Um, so uh, uh, I was a little bit worried about this because, you know, he displaced a lot of people. It was army fighting in a civilian area. But uh, this turned out, this step turned out to be enormously popular among Pakistanis. It turns out, you know, because four years ago you did opinion polling and they said Taliban, good guys, you know, they're anti-imperialists, they're good Muslims. Uh, but gradually, people had gotten a sense that maybe there's something wrong with those people. You know, they're a little bit too rigid. You know, the beating people for dating, maybe not, not the best part of Pakistani culture. And um, as they took more territory, as they, you know, forbade girls to go to school and things like that, they made a bad name for themselves with the rest of the Pakistanis. And so, I was surprised to see in the past year, I, we, we watched the Urdu television at home and so forth, they started to sound like Fox Cable News. They said, our brave soldiers have achieved yet another victory over the wretched terrorist uh, uh, extremist Taliban. You know, they weren't talking like that four years ago. So um, there have been two big campaigns now by the Pakistani military against Pakistani Taliban, who some of whom had been going over and blowing up things in Afghanistan. So this is an issue for Obama's Afghanistan uh, uh, policy. Uh, and in a way, you know, uh, the British had never gone in, up in there in, in an effective way. Obama, I would argue, has changed over 100 years of, of government policy towards the Northwest frontier. He's gotten the Pakistani government to assert itself in those areas and to dislodge the, the, the Taliban. Um, 
In Afghanistan, you have a, a, a return of uh, Taliban after they were overthrown in 2001. You know, they weren't really gone. They just, like, they used to like to wear those black turbans when they were in power, so they just like went home and put on white ones. Um, <laughs> they were still there. And over time, they've come back out, uh, something like 15,000 have taken up back up arms, and they've got an ongoing insurgency. Uh, and Obama came into office determined that he was going to put down the Taliban, uh, uh, destroy al-Qaeda once and for all, uh, and uh, that meant having to do a troop escalation uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. And he initially sent in 21,000 troops. He's now determined to send in more. Uh, he's getting out of Iraq, but he's building up U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Uh, there's been a major campaign recently in Helmand province, a major center for uh, poppy and opium production. Uh, the, a lot of this violence in Afghanistan is fueled by drugs. It's kind of like Colombia. It's a narco uh, terrorism. Uh, and uh, the Marines went into uh, Marja and they're destroying the labs and uh, uh, trying to uh, expel the Taliban. And Obama says he's going to quickly train up the Afghan National Army. Uh, and then by summer of 2011, uh, hoping to start turning Afghanistan over to them and starting to withdraw. So it's a surge or a troop escalation uh, for 18 months, followed by a gradual withdrawal. Uh, it's not clear it will work. A lot of Obama's uh, policy in Afghanistan, and he was there uh, uh, just a few days ago, depends on the Afghan government being mm, capable and uh, uh, efficient and not corrupt. That's a big premise. <laughs> and uh, they had presidential elections last August, which are widely thought to have been stolen by the incumbent, uh, Hamid Karzai. There's a lot of tension about that. There's a lot of corruption in the Afghan officer corps. Uh, there's a lot of drug use in the, uh, among the troops. Uh, and 90% of the army is illiterate. That that doesn't mean they can't fight, but you know it's a disadvantage to be illiterate if you're in the army. Uh, if you send them to such and such street in Kandahar, they might have to ask the Taliban where that is. Um, <laughs> it's hard to train them. They give them two weeks, and apparently it's mostly pointing and cleaning your rifle. And I, don't, I don't know. The idea that you could build up 250,000 efficient troops uh, and police by summer of 2011 and then start getting out strikes me as a non-starter. Um, so you've got two wins for Obama. You've got, uh, I think, a successful policy in Iraq and a successful policy in Pakistan. And you've got a huge question mark in Afghanistan. Uh, then uh, uh, just a couple more points. Uh, in Iran, uh, Obama came into office wanting to engage them, as I said. Uh, but he, his policy in Iran, I think, was derailed by two things. One was that their presidential election, like the Afghan one, was contested. Uh, the outcome was declared for uh, incumbent Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, but a very large number of Iranians believed the election was stolen and that the true president should be Mir Hossein Mousavi, uh, Ahmadinejad's rival. Um, and uh, one of uh, Mir Hossein Mousavi's strong campaign points on the campaign trail against Ahmadinejad was that Ahmadinejad was a buffoon who had made Iran a laughingstock in the world community. Uh, but uh, the regime very quickly declared Ahmadinejad the winner. And in response to which, hundreds of thousands of people came out in the streets numerous times throughout the past year in the capital of Tehran. And there were significant demonstrations in other cities. Well, that put Obama in a bind. Because he, he didn't come into this worrying about Iranian domestic politics. He was thinking geopolitically. The United States has outstanding issues with Iran. Well, let's see if we can't roll them up. You know, can we do a deal with the Iranians over the things we worry about? Their nuclear enrichment program, which we wish they would stop. Their uh, uh, rejectionist stance towards Israel. Their supplying of arms and material and money to Hamas and Hezbollah. There are a lot of things, you know, Iraq, uh, how helpful or unhelpful they are there. Uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan and Iraq are on either side of Iran. 
There were a lot of things that Obama wanted to talk to the regime about and thought maybe they could do a deal, maybe they could come to some compromises. Obama, you know, believes in uh, job owning and in, in just keeping at it until you get a compromise. Uh, I can't say it's always served him well, uh, but uh, it, in his, inside his own party it maybe has served him well. Uh, but he, he took the same attitude that he had to uh, John Boehner, to, uh, to Ahmadinejad. Um, and he got slapped away both times. So in uh, October 1st, they went to Geneva and uh, uh, Obama made a, a proposal to the Iranians. They said, you've got a stock of low enriched uranium. Uh, you need to bump it up to, it's, it's a three and a half percent enriched. Uh, they've got a reactor that produces medical isotopes, it's running out of fuel and, you know, to treat cancer and so forth. You need 19.75 uh, enrichment uh, to run the medical isotope reactor. So you take your stock of low enriched uranium, you send it to Russia or France, some other country, have it, them enrich it to 19.75%, send it back and use it in your medical reactor. That way we get the low enriched uranium, which could be a stock for ultimately for making a bomb, out of Iran, and everybody sighs a, a, a breath of relief, uh, and Iran gets medical isotopes, which its medical establishment needs for treating certain diseases. So the representative of the supreme leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, said, yes, that's a deal we'll take. Then he goes back to Iran, and he gets slapped around, and he comes back out and says, well, no, you know, I don't think we can take that deal. And then he limps off the podium. I, I, I thought he was the representative of the supreme leader. Who was it that overruled him? This is not clear. So I think that uh, the likelihood is that the Revolutionary Guards and the hardliners uh, have um, uh, a lot of influence in Iran now, and they're not interested in Obama's dialogue. Uh, finally, as you all know, uh, the Israel-Palestine thing isn't going well. Right-wing government in Israel is very devoted to building and settling in the West Bank and, and, and East Jerusalem. The Palestinians say they're not going to even talk to the Israelis as long as they're kind of, from a Palestinian point of view, stealing their land. Uh, Obama came into office hoping to move quickly to a two-state solution. Uh, the Palestinians divided between the Palestine Liberation Organization and Hamas, so they don't speak with a single voice. And then the Israelis do speak with a single voice, and it is no, it is devoted to their having no Palestinian state. So Obama doesn't have good relations at the moment with Netanyahu, and uh, that's, that's not going well. So, uh, to conclude, uh, Obama has, I think, uh, a good process going in Iraq for U.S. disengagement without Iraq falling into chaos. And I, the implications of that process are that the U.S. is likely to have much better relations with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia, with the Gulf, and so forth. So this is a major achievement uh, if it continues this way. Uh, it's very uh, significant. Obama has swung Pakistani policy around maybe not 100 percent, but 80 percent uh, to be much more helpful in putting down the Taliban, much more helpful in recognizing Pakistan's own security needs, uh, and uh, that really, I think, is a, is a very significant achievement. Um, the Afghanistan uh, surge is a gamble. We, it was too early to know whether it, he's going to win or lose that one. It could turn into a, a quagmire, of course, uh, and you have uh, uh, no movement on uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict or on Iran. Uh, so those, those are big issues that you know, are very important to people in the region on which Obama still hasn't ma managed to put his mark. Uh, so it's a very mixed picture, uh, but what I would like to say is that I think at least Obama is going in the right direction. I think we were going in the wrong direction with regard to a relationship with that part of the world uh, in the first part of uh, the last decade, uh, that Obama uh, has established a new framework. Uh, he's established uh, that he, he doesn't hate all Muslims, uh, he doesn't intend to invade countries, occupy people, uh, that he can be a reliable partner. 
and that he wants to do the right thing, both for US interests and for the interests of the local people. And for that, he is enormously popular in the Muslim world. Uh, and uh, even if a lot of Arabs are very skeptical what he's going to be able to do about uh, Palestine and Israel, uh, and even if the Afghan, Afghanistan troop escalation is not popular in most of the Muslim world, uh, but they seem to be willing to give him a benefit of a doubt. So I would say, as somebody who professionally observes this region uh, every day, all day, uh, and has done so for 30 years, uh, that uh, Obama came into office with a set of enormous challenges uh, uh, that, that he has taken them on and he's had real successes. Uh, I'd give him a B plus. Uh, let me leave it there and we'll take questions. Thank you, um, Professor Dr. Cole. I'd like to ask you to define three things for us um, that you kind of touched on earlier in your talk. I'm wondering if you can define concentration camp. You say that Bakram, Abu Ghraib, and, um, and uh, Guantanamo are concentration camps. My understanding of a concentration camp is a uh, tool for the systematic torture and annihilation of a certain people group. And I'm wondering how that fits in with your definition. Uh, I'd like also for you to find fascism for us, because I believe you touched on fascism and said that it was a system of government um, promulgated by Christian Europeans. But I think fascism is more of like, a, a, in a general term, in a general sense, maybe historically, of course, we have fascism in Italy and Spain and the Vichy French, but um, isn't fascism more of a hierarchical, authoritarian, anti-democratic? anti-democracy form of government. I think that's what fascism means. Also, I'm wondering what you would call um, Osama bin Laden, because I think if Bugsy Siegel would have been a rabbi, you may have called him a Jewish gangster. Um, Obama seem, or excuse me, uh, Osama bin Laden seems to exhibit a lot of the tendencies of someone you would call Islamic and obviously a terrorist, so I'm wondering what you would call sure. bin Laden. Well, let me just take your last point first, which is that the, the correct diction is Muslim. All kinds of Muslim criminals, low lives, people you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley, terrorists, Muslims, They're not Islamic. As Islamic as a term like Judaic implies a set of ideals. Uh, so that I think we can dispose of that pretty easily. With regard to concentration camp, no, you're mi mixing up between concentration camp and death camp. There's a difference. Concentration camps, people you, you place, you concentrate prisoners. And I call them concentration camps to be provo provocative because a lot of people in there were tortured. We know this. They were tortured by the definition of torture in international law. And they were also deprived of the basic rights that our founders were devoted for, uh, devoted to. You know, um, they weren't babes in the wood, our founders. Uh, and they had seen the British form of government uh, implement habeas corpus in a very invidious and unfair way. Sometimes people could have it, sometimes not. There were star chambers. There were bills of attainder where you would target a particular person for prosecution in a way that there was no particular law that, that governed that. It was just the king didn't like that guy. Uh, and so they established a, a system in, of, of habeas corpus that if you're arrested, uh, then you have the right to demand that, that you be produced before a judge and the arrest be justified. They also demanded that there be a process for determining innocence or guilt and that it be relatively quick. The idea that you could just take hundreds of people, put them in limbo, torture them, and never make any decision about whether they're actually supposed to be there of, of any judicial sort, because there were, of course, military re review boards and so forth. I say that's a concentration camp. Um, and uh, I think it's shameful. I think we should all, as Americans, bear it as a badge of shame that we did this. And I don't think it was uh, in the uh, traditions of our, of our best values as Americans <coughs> uh, to respond to what was a genuine threat 
in quite that way. I think that our system is strong. We did try uh, 600 terrorists uh, in the past decade. It is possible to try them. We have imprisoned them. Ahmed Rassam, a terrorist, a member of the armed Islamic group of Algeria, an Al-Qaeda affiliate, is caught at the border between Canada and Washington State, bringing in explosives to blow up LAX. He was arrested. He was tried. He's in federal penitentiary. He's in a maximum security penitentiary. He'll be there the rest of his life. So um, I don't think it was necessary to waterboard people and keep them without access to real lawyers or real uh, uh, judicial process. I've forgotten the third. Oh, fascism. All I'm saying is that Islamofascism, I was attacking the term, the phraseology Islamic, Islamofascism. I was simply pointing out that it, 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 it's being deployed by people to defame the Muslim regions of the world and to imply that there's some intrinsic connection between Islam and uh, fascist forms of government. I was simply saying that it seems to me that the people who use the term that way have a very short memory as to how historical fascism actually developed and where it developed. And by the way, you know, al although it's true that uh, some fascists were secular people and or pagans or disliked Christianity and so forth, the Franco regime was hand, hand in glove with the church. Uh, and, it, and, and, you know, if you, if, if, I think it was a very offensive term. I wouldn't use it under, under, under ordinary circumstances. But I think if you wanted to say that Franco was a Christo-fascist, you know, I, 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 I think the argument could be made. We could have a dialogue about whether that's a legitimate a way of speaking or not. I think it's not. <coughs> but, uh, but I think it's, it's wrong because there was nothing Christian about Franco's values. It is true that he supported the church. The church supported him. Uh, so, um, uh, I, and I think that actually fascism as a term is awfully difficult to define. That political scientists, when you look into it, find that it's very, it's different in each country. Spanish fascism was not like, French fascism was not like Italian. And of course, the Germans really went wild with this thing. It's very unusual what they did. I mean, in a way, they defamed fascism. Uh, so, um, I don't think that, th that the um, uh, Egyptian regime is a fascist regime. I don't think that the Iranian one is. So I don't know who are they talking about exactly when they, they talk about Islamofascism. I can't find it. Is it on now? Oh. Professor Cole, thank you for your talk. It's uh, an excellent overview of the area. I'd like to ask you two quick questions about Afghanistan. Um, I just don't see what we're doing is going to work out. And one of the basic reasons, as you alluded to this, is that the normal interpretation of what a nation state is simply just does not exist in Afghanistan. It's a collection of warlords and opium dealers and what have you, various groups. So two questions I'd like to ask you. One, the training of the police army, by most interpretations, has been an utter failure. They've spent over $8 billion, and its ability to, to work with the Americans and other allied troops has been extremely limited, if almost non-existent. And I'd like you to maybe talk a little bit more about that. You did bring, touch on that subject. And without this group, unlike Iraq, where it is starting to become more effective and being able to control the country, there is no way the, the Afghan uh, training is anywhere close to what's going on in Iraq. Second question, President Karzai's brother, which has been noted by the, by the international press, including the New York Times and Washington Post, has direct ties and is part of the opium trade. Now, the United States government, Obama administration, very quietly has asked Karzai to remove his brother, in essence, maybe send him out of the country, make him an ambassador or something to get him out of the picture. He is now, we come to find out, going to be put in charge of the Kandahar province, which is the next major flashpoint for a military to deal with the Taliban. And this is a major stronghold. This can make or break the whole Afghan operation. I find this, if, if this does hold true, that Karzai does put his brother, who is a major opium dealer and corrupt as hell, in charge of the Kandahar province. This is insane. This is insane for the United States uh, military and politicians to accept this from President Karzai. Could you please touch on those two yeah. subjects? Well, it's worse, uh, as I understand it, Wali Karzai is already in charge of Kandahar. Uh, so, um, uh, well, finding a prominent Afghan politician who's powerful and has nothing to do with the opium trade and heroin trade might be <coughs> difficult. Uh, that is their, among their major industries. 
I figure not in purchasing power parity, but in uh, international exchange rates. The Afghan uh, gross national product, probably something on the order of 10 or 11 billion dollars a year. That's a whole country. That's a country of 34 million. And it's the fifth poorest country in the world. 10 or 11 billion dollars a year. If you do it purchasing power parity, you know, because the eggs don't cost international prices, you could maybe say it's 30 billion. Uh, about a third of that comes from heroin. So you take that away, they're really poor. I mean, they're maybe the poorest uh, in the world. And it's been a country since 1979 at war. It's a maelstrom. Uh, it's, I talked about all those widows and orphans in Iraq. Iraq is a paradise compared to Afghanistan. Um, there was an Iranian film called Kandahar, which the director showed these Afghans sort of limping on one foot, hopping, because the country had two million mines, and the Soviets and the Mujahideen both put them in. And when the war was over, people just walked on them, blew off their feet. There were all kinds of people with one foot, one arm, and so forth in Afghanistan. So it's not a normal country. It's a country that's been distorted by 30 years of war. Uh, you had uh, 3 million people displaced to Pakistan. You had 2 million displaced to Iran. This was in a country of 20 million. Uh, you had another 2 million displaced internally, 2 million dead, 6 million wounded. Uh, so, um, you know, to imagine that you can go in there and recruit an army, train it, stand it up, and say, so long, now you guys are in charge, in short order, it's just not going to happen. It's, it's, a, it's a very rural country. Uh, urbanization is among the lowest in the world. It's, it's got very high rates of illiteracy. About 20, I think 27% of the country is literate, uh, which means we're not getting the best people in the Army because it's only 10% it's only literate. Um, and uh, uh, right, so. Um, they're not like Iraq. You know, Iraq was an industrialized country. It uh, had uh, high rates of literacy for the Middle East, uh, uh, even a lot of urban and women's development and so forth. Afghanistan's not like that. So I don't know what you do about it. I mean, it, it, it used to more or less work under the old king back in the 60s, but it's, it's been destroyed. The system has been destroyed. It's not clear how you put it back together. It's, it's the most difficult thing the United States will ever have attempted is to set Afghanistan on its feet. Uh, and the idea that you could do this in 18 months is, is just laughable. So um, on the other hand, you know, it's not as bad as it might look. Uh, the Tajiks and the Hazara Shiites and the Uzbeks, the people in the north of the country who are a majority, uh, don't seem to mind NATO or the US being there. In fact, they're sort of figuring out what could we get from these people. Uh, and then the Pushtuns, a lot of them mind it, but then others of them are allied with Karzai. So, you know, it seems to be like about 10 or 15 percent of the country is under Taliban insurgent rule. Uh, and there are only 15,000 Taliban fighters, they're guerrilla fighters. I would say it doesn't make any difference. You take Kandahar, you don't take Kandahar. It's not like they're going to stand and fight or they control territory. They, they, they will melt away in the mountains and then they'll come back at you when you're not expecting it. I don't think that it'll be decisive, this Kandahar thing. Uh, and I think it's symbolic politics in a way. But, you know, it's the kind of thing where you, I can't imagine the U.S. losing, uh, certainly not anytime soon, but it just could grind away at us. I mean, we really want to be there in 2025, still, you know, killing Taliban. Uh, and I don't think the Taliban are going anyplace. Should I recognize them? Uh, with this nonviolent Muslim world, could you help us to understand the jihad against America, who it is, where it is, what it is, why it is? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, the word jihad uh, occurs in the Quran to mean kind of putting yourself out for the faith. It doesn't mean violence. Uh, it came to have some of those connotations in the medieval period 
when religions of all sorts were becoming violent, you'll remember that the Christians uh, um, invaded Palestine under the Crusades. They, the idea that Christians should be warriors, should, should be crusaders, not something I can get out of the New Testament very easily. Uh, and likewise in the Quran, uh, the Quran says that uh, if people sue for peace, if they want to make peace with you, you should always do it. Uh, you should never be an aggressor. And then it says that you will find that the closest in love of people to Muslims are the Christians. Somehow that verse doesn't get quoted enough. Uh, so the Quran has a high place in uh, its universe for, uh, for Christianity and Christians. Uh, it praises the Bible generally. It praises the children of Israel. It sings praises of Jesus, Moses, and so forth. So, uh, but in the medieval period, the Muslim empire and the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire were at daggers drawn. Uh, they were fighting each other on the frontier all the time. And the, the Byzantine Empire was a Christian, Eastern Orthodox Christian Empire. And so there were people out there in the frontier uh, who were Muslims who began using the word jihad in a new way to mean a violent struggle for the faith against the Byzantine uh, Empire. Uh, and they went on like that for a thousand years. Uh, and um, uh, in the 20th century, uh, as the Muslim world came out from under French and British and other European colonial rule, they invoked these ideas about violent struggle for the faith as part of anti-colonialism, as part of getting rid of this foreign occupation. And uh, it became respectable in some quarters to talk like that. But there are rules for, even for the, the violence in the name of the faith that were developed by the medieval jurists. First of all, no sneak attacks. You have to let the other guy know you're coming. It's, it's chivalric. It's like Knights of the Round Table. You can't kill innocent women, children, uh, or non-combatant men. Uh, it has to be authorized by the powers that be, the sultan, government, the clergy, uh, and so forth. Uh, and as you can tell, the classical rules of Islamic warfare uh, would rule out the September 11th attacks on the United States. They, they contravened every single Islamic law of war. Uh, but um, what happened was that in the second half of the 20th century, essentially cult-like groups, uh, and I, I wasn't joking when I compared some of our militias to them, grew up in, in some countries, Egypt, uh, Pakistan, uh, and some others, uh, which often were promoted by young people that didn't have a religious education. They were engineers and so forth. And they started saying things like, anybody can declare holy war a jihad. It doesn't have to be the government. It doesn't have to be the clergy who have eight years of seminary training. Uh, the hydroponic engineer who's 22 can declare war on Europe. Uh, and, and indeed ought to. Uh, and uh, some of these young people got together in kind of communes. Uh, some of them uh, would, would rent sh furnished apartments, which are expensive in Cairo, and they would send p some of their group out to work in the oil countries and, and make money and uh, pay for the apartments. And they had this hothouse atmosphere of terrorism. And they started attacking their government officials. They would kidnap a cabinet member, they would blow something up. Uh, and you know, the analogy that I can think of for it was kind of like in, in, in Europe during the Cold War, you had the, the Red Brigades in Italy, uh, the Baden Meinhof gang in Germany, and so forth. These were young people who became radicalized. But the things that they said about what Islam expected of a person were completely different from the normative Muslim tradition or what, if you went to Al Azhar Seminary, the great center of Muslim learning, kind of like their Vatican and ask you know, the, the, the uh, rector of Al-Azhar, uh, can, you know, in the name of Islam, can you blow up a bus with innocent children? And he would always say no. So these were fringe groups. Um, and I think they wouldn't have amounted to quite so much except that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979. So you had a communist, atheist, European country uh, dominating a, a major Muslim country. 
And these guys all gathered there from Egypt, from Jordan, from Algeria, from Libya, Indonesia, and to, to fight the godless atheist communists. And at the time, you know, we in the United States cheered them on. We thought this was a good idea. Uh, we had second thoughts later on. Uh, but they were full of these hothouse ideas about anybody being able to declare jihad, uh, about violence always being justified, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the means justify the ends and so forth. And they, the UN, United States and Saudi Arabia gave them altogether something like $10 billion, uh, well, to the Mujahideen, and it, it circulated. Uh, and the Saudi, foreign, the Saudi intelligence minister was asked by the U.S. To, to find somebody to fundraise for this effort. And they uh, looked around. They wanted somebody from a wealthy socialite family who was nevertheless kind of Islamically committed. And they found a young man named Osama bin Laden, whose father, Mohammed bin Laden, ran the bin Laden group that was building airports and uh, shopping malls and so forth all through Asia and the Middle East. So um, these weird fringe ideas of these young cultists in places like Egypt suddenly became concentrated with loads of money behind them in the struggle against the Soviets in Afghanistan. And in the aftermath of the defeat of the Soviets, they felt pretty good about themselves. Uh, they kind of ignored the fact that like the world's superpower, the United States, had been on their side and maybe helped a little bit. Uh, and then they looked around for other struggles. They found Muslims oppressed in Kashmir and Bosnia and so on and so forth. And you know the story after that. But the thing to underline is that the number of people who would actually be violent to the United States in the Muslim world is vanishingly small. Uh, Mark Sageman, who was a CIA uh, station chief in Pakistan late in the Afghan war, uh, wrote a book called Understanding Terrorist Networks. He estimates that it's less than 1,000. So I think the thing one has to remember is uh, that uh, the, the, the radical interpretation of jihad, not the normative one, is, is, a, is a very small fringe in the Muslim world. It's dangerous. We should be vigilant against it. I consult with, with our security agencies about it. Uh, it's not to be taken lightly because a little bit of C4 plastic explosives go a long way. Uh, but it's not, it's not characteristic of the mainstream of the Muslim community to have these beliefs or to behave that way. Thank you very much. Would you want to take one last question from Rafael? Okay. What will happen if and when Iran develops the atomic bomb? Well, what will happen when and if Iran develops the atomic bomb? Uh, it seems to me that were they able to develop one, then the story would be over with. Because so far, at least, if anybody has a bomb, you contain them, you punish them with sanctions, as we do with North Korea or whatever, but you don't mess with them. So, uh, in a way, the likelihood of war between the United States and Iran is greater in that period during which they haven't developed one. Uh, and I think that um, there may be uh, a crunch time coming, 18 months, two years down the road, where the United States intelligence may decide that Iranian enrichment, and right now it's civilian enrichment, there's no weapons program that anybody can find. Uh, but that Iranian enrichment is getting sophisticated enough so that you could imagine them deciding to go full bore for a bomb and being able to pull it off in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and at that point, the US has to decide whether it will risk that development uh, or whether a pretty severe intervention is warranted. The only things that I can see that would uh, stop, and it, if, if, if Iran decided to get a bomb, and, and I believe they have not made that decision, I, and this is also the, um, what, Leo, uh, um, what Panetta is saying at the CIA, but uh, if they were to decide to get one, uh, the only way I can see to stop it would be uh, to do what we did in Iraq. I mean, I think you'd have to invade and establish a different government. Uh, you might be able to stop it by uh, a, a nuclear attack on the facilities near Esfahan, but the world reaction to that, I think, would be, let us say, extremely negative. Uh, world reaction to a, a U.S. invasion of Iran would also be negative. And I think a U.S. invasion of Iran uh, would be inadvisable even to stop a nuclear uh, weapons program because Iran is three times more populous than Iraq. 
It is the size of Germany, France, and Spain all rolled together. You know our maps lie. They, they make Belgium look large and Iran look small. I think they must have been made by Belgians. Belgians and, uh, so, but it's a huge country, very populous, very nationalist, armed to the, uh, you know, they've got a lot of guns and things. So I wouldn't, I, I think it would be a, a, a very hard fought war and uh, a hard fought uh, occupation. And uh, I think the United States probably doesn't have the money in the bank to do it. Uh, but um, uh, aside from that eventuality, I rather fear that if the, if the Iranians were to go for a bomb, that there would be very little that we could do about it short of a war. Uh, on the other hand, um, I don't think they want a bomb. I think they want what is called the Japan option, or sometimes nuclear latency. Everybody knows if the Japanese became very, very threatened by the North Koreans or the Chinese, then China and North Korea don't push them too far. Uh, and I think that's the position Iran wants to be in. They want not to attract the kind of opprobrium and sanctions that actually blowing up a bomb might, might induce, uh, but they want to have the uh, defense against an invasion uh, uh, and an overthrow that uh, a nuclear latency or Japan option would produce. Remember, from the time that Mr. Bush went to the United Nations and more or less signaled that the U.S. would invade Iraq in September of 2002, until there were boots in, on the ground uh, in late March uh, was eight months. And if Iraq had actually had nuclear latency, they might have been able to blow a bomb up uh, in time to forestall that invasion. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that's what Iran's scenario is. Uh, and so I, it's not something that keeps me up late at night. I don't think they want a bomb, and I'm not afraid of them having nuclear latency as long as they don't make one. Thank you. Thank you. Well, no speaker who's done an incisive job gets away without getting the signature Ralph Allenstein tote bag, a real treasure in West Michigan. <laughs> Professor Cole, thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget the round table tomorrow in Allendale at the Cook DeWitt Auditorium at 10 a.m. in the morning. We're going to have a very distinguished panel of scholars from Grand Valley and Calvin College who will unpack the words, the meaning that you heard this evening. See you tomorrow. Thanks very much. You mentioned there's a book signing. Oh, and also there is a book signing in the back. There is a book signing. Professor Cole will sign copies of his book, Engaging the Muslim World. Ha, ha, ha.